understanding comes from listening to yourself first. You know, what are the biases I'm bringing? What are the things that are distracting me from this conversation? How do I make sure I stay focused? And, and all of those lead us to listening to the actual meaning that is occurring in the conversation. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hello there and welcome to the My Future Business Show. It's Rick Nusky here. So wonderful to see you again. It's been a little bit of a break uh, over the course of uh, last week or so, so it's great to be back with you. And now on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming writer, author, TEDx speaker, podcaster and executive coach at TransformingLives.coach, Mr. Brian Gorman. Welcome to the show, Brian. Rick, I am excited to be here. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure and a treat, I'm sure, for everybody to uh, have this opportunity to spend some time with you. Now, you and I are going to be talking about the process of change and what that means and the challenges behind launching and sustaining a new business and the singular change journey someone can follow that will enable them to stay connected to their passion and will lead them to ultimately achieving their vision. So there's a lot to unpack here, but uh, it's <laughs> there's a, it's customary for us, Brian, to learn a little bit more about you outside of the business. So uh, let's start off by finding out where you're calling in from today. I'm actually in Hoboken, New Jersey. So literally across the river from New York City, I can actually see um, the World Trade Center and uh, the Empire State Building out of my living room windows. That's incredible. So what do you love about the place? The busyness? Is it very busy there? Or uh, Well, it's interesting. Uh, Hoboken is a commuter community, mm -hmm. if you will, yep. to Manhattan. Sometimes it's referred to as the sixth borough. It's um, very dense. Yep. Uh, my understanding we're, is we're about the fifth densest city in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, was the the scene or the, the setting for the movie On the Waterfront oh, many, yes. many years ago? Yes, yes. Um, the waterfront looks very different now. I bet it does. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's all parkland. <laughs> um, but what I love is the convenience to New York City, the sense of community. Yep. And um, since I moved to New York City and the New York City region in 1986, I haven't owned a car. Oh, wow. It's funny that you talk about a sense of community. I don't normally in my own minds, I associate a sense of community with something like New York City. What is it because it's on the outer perimeter of it or? When I lived in New York City, I used to define it as the world with all the empty space taken out. <laughs> so it actually, even in New York City, is a cluster of community after community after community. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me something. Prior to living where you are today, where did you grow up? I actually grew up about 12 miles north of here in uh, suburban New Jersey. Yeah. Um, left there in at the age of 17 to go to college up in upstate New York at Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. um, lived in Syracuse two different stints for a total of nine years, San Antonio, Texas, um, while I was in the U.S. Air Force for four years. Yep. And uh, I was in Minneapolis for six years. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing, Brian. Now, I always like to, I guess, uh, flip back through the pages of, of time through our lives. And I, I always look at relationships because I think they're the building blocks of everything that we are today. So tell us a little bit about um, people, I guess, when you're a, a young man uh, who influenced you, help, who helped you in those formative years to become the man you've become today. Um, I think I really, Rick, I, I want to start there with... Um, a little bit of my story yes, please. As, I, as I begin my TEDx talk. When I went to Syracuse, I was 17. Mm -hmm. I was an introvert and I was an Eagle Scout. And I really wanted to change that disconnect I felt from the people around me. So I joined Alpha Phi Omega, which is the National Service Fraternity here in the U.S. Mm -hmm and uh, began doing youth work on the Onondaga Indian Reservation outside of Syracuse. One of our fraternity brothers uh, was Brian McLean. Brian was a, 
disabled in a wheelchair. Um, we're talking about back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, when uh, there was no such thing as uh, accommodations for people with disabilities. Right. And Brian really taught me a lot, a lot, a lot about um, the importance of not putting people in boxes. Of course, um, yeah. He, he he was and remains today just an incredible, incredible human being. Um, if we sort of fast forward, um, when I was working at the University of Minnesota, I had the good fortune to work with a man uh, named David Lilly. David is deceased now, but uh, David came out of World War II and he and a buddy uh, bought a lawnmower repair shop. They turned that into the um, lawn products company, Toro. And David retired as CEO of Toro, um, joined the Federal Reserve Board, became Dean of the School of Management, and eventually the Vice President for Finance and Operations mm -hmm. at the university. And um, he just really helped me get a lot of business wisdom um, in, in my work with him. He was just very insightful. Um, very, I, I have seen, had seen when I was working with him, David ask someone three or four questions that led the individual to know that David knew he was totally blowing smoke <laughs> and he was not going to last in his job much longer. And he oh, actually wow. resigned the next day. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, That's telling, isn't it? <laughs> then there was Alcest Pappas, and Alcest um, was a, a partner at KPMG in their higher education practice. And I got to work with her as a client as we were looking at how to restructure the university. And uh, when that was all done and we had uh, recommended that my job go away, <laughs> I, I went to work with Alcest. And, and again, just really... Um, really learned from her um, what consulting is all about. And, and um, while I was working with Alcest, I had the opportunity to train in organizational change management with Daryl Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl uh, Connor, John Cotter, and William Bridges are really recognized as the founders of the profession of change management. And uh, Alcest made that connection for me. Daryl and I are still friends and, and co-workers on occasion today. Yeah, wow. Um, so those are some of the big players. Yeah, thank you again for sharing. That's wonderful insight because you just you can see how powerful it is to give context to the people that you've been exposed to, worked with, learned from, created relationships with. And I think that word relationships means a great deal. But before we do that, I'd just like to pivot out a moment and talk about um, the importance of, of travel to you. And do you, get a, do you get around the world? Do you like to travel? And what's your favorite destination? Um, I loved to travel more than I do these days. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I agree. Um, my favorite two cities that I've been to uh, outside of the U.S. are Buenos Aires and and uh, Florence in Florence. Italy. Now, uh, can I, I also ask go ahead? I also had the the good fortune of being able to travel to Antarctica. Oh, wow. How Which was, was that? quite the experience. Quite the experience. Now, I, it's funny because it seems so cold, yet you can get very badly sunburned, I hear, under your nose. <laughs> yeah, we had a barbecue on the ship deck in 35 degree weather. Wow, you wouldn't believe it, would you? Now, I also know, uh, I've, I've been doing my research, and I, I know that yoga has played a big part of your life. Tell us a little bit about your experience with yoga, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, I really started yoga after coming out of a, a very bad uh, relationship, a relationship that did not end well. Mm -hmm. And we've all um, been there. <laughs> um, it became for me a what way to find alignment between body, uh, spirit, mind. Mm -hmm. So it, it really brought a lot of centering and peace to my life 
at a very disrupted time. Now, does this keep you uh, on track today? What's a daily routine look like for you? Do you have meditation? Do you do yoga and so forth? I do have a daily practice. Um, it used to include yoga. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of damage, um, both to my rotate, both rotator cuffs, and, and I have one leg that uh, every once in a while, after a, a torn muscle decides that it no longer it does wants to hold thing. me up. <laughs> Good. <-o. laughs> So, that's so a, yoga, yoga that's convenient. is not a good practice. <laughs> Probably giving a miss but, today. <laughs> but I do have a, a morning routine, and a mm. lot of it grew out of my yoga practice. Excellent. Um, it begins with uh, chanting, actually. Yep. yep. And um, I, I use a um, mala that I bought when I was on a pilgrimage in India, and I do 108 of the Gayatri Mantra which of one of the translations of Gayatri is may the wisdom of the world and my wisdom be one. I then move into a prayer of Thanksgiving and that's built on my experience with Native American cultures and it's a prayer to the seven directions. So it begins with a, a prayer to the East uh, for all the gifts that I will receive in the day and, and those gifts are not always positive. They're, both challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. um, and, and so forth and so on. And then it, it moves to the South for all with that, which I receive the, those gifts, my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, and, and, and so forth. And for all the experience I've lived to bring me to this day. Yeah. I then uh, move to the West and that is a prayer for all the gifts that I will be able to give to others over the course of the day and to north, true north for guiding me through the day and granting me peace and rest at night. Um, the prayer then moves to Father Sky for the sun, the moon, the wind, the rain, the snow, the stars, the seasons. Um, Mother Earth for food, clothing, for shelter and for nourishing my roots through all of these generations. And then finally to, to one that all that is me and all that is the universe be one. That's incredible. So from, from there, I move to a prayer uh, of blessing um, for individual members of my family and f friends. Thank you again for sharing. This is what I love about the My Future Business Show. We don't just talk business. We talk about people because really at the end of the day, if you've got two feet in the heartbeat, you're the most important thing about your business. And, you know, I wonder, you talked a little bit about culture momentarily there. And uh, obviously a big focus of our discussion today is about managing change and accepting it and knowing that it's uh, pretty much omnipresent. How do other cultures do you, do you see um, manage um, going through change? I guess I would have to say from cultures that are there to help people move through change to cultures that will do everything they can to prevent it from happening. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, you know, it's one end of the spectrum to the other there, isn't it? Well, and, and, we can see it, and I don't know how much of uh, our news reaches you in Australia. All of it. Um, but, you know, on, on that second extreme, if you will, you have people like Elon Musk saying that, you know, if you want to work for me at, uh, I think it was at Tesla, he said, um, you're going to be working at least 40 hours in the office for me every week. Mm. Or, as he put it, go steal time from somebody else. Um, <laughs> and then I'm working with clients who are looking at um, either moving to a, a hybrid culture or a totally virtual culture and some form of a reduced hour work week while maintaining or uh, increasing their productivity. And it's happening, isn't it? And it's happening. Yeah, I can't. I, I don't understand the old school way of thinking. If we can demonstrate clearly through measurable outcomes that we are still, if not uh, as effective, if not more effective at, at doing our job, it just seems uh, 
ridiculous, doesn't it? Almost. It, it, it is. And it's so funny, Rick. Um, when I begin those conversations with some business owners and, and senior executives, hmm. they say, but if we don't have people in the office um, and, and we don't have the equivalent of a time clock, you know, managers making sure people are at their desks. Yep. Um, how do we measure productivity? <laughs> and <laughs> my response is, you know, butts and seats doesn't mean productivity. No. You know, how do you measure? Pro how do you truly measure productivity now? And yeah. there's no reason if you are measuring productivity, there's no reason you can't measure it uh, the same way with a virtual workforce. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the deep and meaningfuls. That's why we have job descriptions. That's why, why we have specific KPIs and they don't change whether or not you're sitting in the chair at home or at work. So thank you very much for that insight. Now, tell me, what do you think the one thing is that you do the best, Brian? Which is superpower, let's call it. I ask good questions. Ah, there you go. Very, very concise questions too, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you again. Now, um, in, in our day-to-days, we can get wrapped up in how busy we become. But really, if you strip back all the things you're doing, everything you're involved in, what makes life worthwhile for you right now, Brian? Coaching my clients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's that simple. simple. simple um, well, and, and I, I, I want to qualify that. That's my work life. And, yeah, yeah. There, there is another part of my life, but um, one of the first questions that I ask my clients is, what makes your heart sing? Yeah. And some clients don't know. And so really working them to help them discover their passion. Um, many of my clients, especially entrepreneurs, they, they know the answer. It's why they started their businesses. But now they find themselves working for the business instead of the business working for them. So helping them turn that around, put the business back to work for them so that they can live into their dreams. Uh, that's what I'm passionate about. That's where your joy comes from, yeah. isn't it? I can tell. Yeah. And, uh, that's a big thing for me. You know, you see a lot of this. It links back to this being butts in seat in the workplace or, you know, or not. And one of the things I see is a lot of people wanting to, not everyone, some people enjoy being employed, but a lot of people are moving away. They want to transform their lives and become their own boss and do their own thing. But a lot of them are failing at that. What do you think that is? Is it because they have that employee mindset? And how do you move them past that? I think part of it is the employee mindset. Part of it is just not knowing what it means to support yourself in business. Hmm. Not knowing that, you know, if your passion is photography, and, and you take the most incredible photographs in the world, you're not going to succeed if you can't market and, and sell business. Um, you can't succeed if you don't know how to manage your expenses against your income. So it's, it's really some people jump in before they really know what they're jumping into. Hmm. And that's okay as long as you're willing to be open to learning what you need to know to be successful. See, a lot of people jump into the game and get out of the game too quickly, don't they? They don't have enough patient, patience and perseverance. Now, what is a transformational coach and how did you get involved in this wonderful line of work? So a transformational coach really is someone who works with you on the really big changes in your life. Mm -hmm. So I can certainly coach somebody who is looking to move um, up a level in their organization or to uh, find their next job in a, in a different uh, business or whatever. Yeah. But transformation is really, um, I'm not fulfilled in the work that I do. I'm not finding meaning. I'm not finding satisfaction. Um on the, the personal, so a, a few examples, I guess, actually there. Um, I had one client very early on who came to me because he had quit his job. He was mid-career in his 40s. 
um, he had quit his job to go back to school to get his PhD. Yep. And he really wanted me to work with him to restructure, if you will, his lifestyle to that uh, so that he could survive on a graduate student income. Um, when I asked him why, so that's a transformation. Yep. Yep. Um, when I asked him why he was making the move, he said he was the only one in his family without a PhD. Oh, which did not sound to me like a good reason. No, <laughs> he, he literally Rick lasted two days in the program, two hated days. It. Hated it. And then he came back and said, help me find what I really should be doing. Is that gap, isn't it? Um, one other example, a woman who came to me, she said, um, 70, I think she was 71 years old. Mm -hmm. um, she said, I'm a retired academic. I'm burned out on academia. But if I'm sitting around doing nothing for the next 20 years, I'm going to be really pissed at myself. <laughs> Help me find my next uh, vocation, if you will. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so she is now working in uh, applying global mind change to the crisis or the, the, the uh, environmental crisis. It's amazing. I can only imagine the joy and the, the fulfillment you must feel when yeah. you see an outcome from the work that you do. Tell me a little bit about how you feel when this, when this actually happens in front of you. Um, it's interesting for many decades really i did organizational change management consulting mm. at the end of the day i would be tired and feel weighted down oh wow because you're constantly being asked what should i do here uh, how do i do this what happens if that doesn't work and um you know one example i i was on a team of, I think there were probably 30 or 40 of us um, consulting with Merck when it was doing its global transformation. Yep. Um, I was one of a team of about 12 with Merck Manufacturing. Um, that's a lot of weight to carry. A bit. I can only imagine. Um, with coaching, I can be tired at the end of the day, but I'm not weighted down because my role is not to give people my answers to their challenges. It's to help them find the answers that are right for them. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's profound. You know, cause a lot of people try to define coaching and they're very, um, poor at, I guess, uh, at sharing exactly what it means. So thank you so very much. Now you're not just a coach, you're a certified coach. And I think it's important to explore this to, uh, for the sake of those who are going, well, there's coaches are plenty, but I think a certified coach is a little bit different. Tell us a little bit about the certification. So I'm certified by the International Coach Federation, which has tens of thousands of members globally. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a very strong um, set of core competencies and code of ethics. And so my training really started with about uh, 40 hours uh, on site at a retreat center mm -hmm. um, then extended over the next I think it was six months with um, monthly uh, virtual work with working with a uh, coach mentor with um, actually working with clients and having that work reviewed by my coach mentor and so forth followed by another 40 hours of um, on-site to wrap up the training. Yeah. Um, the first certification didn't um, come until I had 100 hours uh, under my belt. And then the ICF administers a pretty strenuous, I think it was a three-hour online exam. <laughs> um, <Thanks>. around <laughs> Around the core competencies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you need continuing education to maintain your certification. Yep. Um, you can move up with ICF. It's associate cer uh, certified coach, professional certified coach, and then master certified coach. Um, each of those requires a, a certain number of uh, hours working with clients. 
um, master certified coaches, 2,500 hours. Yeah, I, I, can I ask, ask you, I, I, I get all this certification. I think it's incredibly important for that, I guess, that credibility component. But tell me a little bit about the, the interpersonal relationship skills someone like yourself needs to have uh, when working with people. Is that important? <laughs> Is an engine important for a car to run? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> At the heart of that, Rick is trust. Um, also, I think at the heart of that is the chemistry. Yep. And at the heart of it, that is the openness to coaching of the clients I work with. Mm -hmm. So I typically will begin with a complimentary coaching session. And the way I frame it is I want to spend most of this next hour delivering value to you. I want every in, one of our interactions to, to be of value to you. Um, so we're going to do some coaching. At the end of that, we can discuss whether or not we each think that there's value in continuing this work together. Um, so that's sort of the framework because I've, I've had not a lot, but I've had a few people who even if they wanted to work with me, I know I would not deliver value because uh, the chemistry wasn't right. They weren't ready for coaching, whatever the reason. Um, then because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> intuition. Well, and it's sometimes it's intuition. Sometimes it's, um, I had one who said, I usually don't make a good client because I'm a lawyer. I could argue it every side of anything <laughs> oh. and he did the whole time i was trying yeah. to coach him here we go <laughs> um the the next piece of it the the really foundational piece i think is trust yeah and um years ago i j trained with judith glasser um who's the author of the book conversational intelligence judith spent decades several decades of her life studying the neuroscience of conversation and um, she built this, this model for building and sustaining trust that I often share with my clients. Uh, several years ago, I did a series of 10 videos on the 10 most important things I'd learned about change in 50 years of uh, change practice. Yep. And her model of trust is one of those 10. And it's, the acronym is T-R-U-S-T. -T. It's the only acronym I use because there's no secret as to what it means. No. Um, it's, it's about trust. The first T is transparency. And most people approach transparency is, you know, let me tell you about myself, Rick, but a piece of transparency in building a trusting relationship is also, and Rick, this is what I need from you. Reciprocate. Reciprocation. Um, you know, as, as a manager, as a leader, um, being transparent, as, asking your people, you know, what do you need from me in order to be successful? How can I be a better leader? Being transparent. Uh, the R is relationship, and that's the relationship of seeing the world through another's eyes. Um, so when that employee misses a deadline, not just coming in with the hammer, but really seeking to understand first what happened. Um, you is understanding, and that is uh, the deep understanding that comes from active listening, appreciative inquiry. Um, not too long ago, I had a conversation with Oscar Trimboli, who's an, another uh, Australian. Mm -hmm. um, who wrote the book, How to Listen. And he really taught me how to even deepen my listening for, further. Um, understanding comes from really listening to yourself first. You know, what are the biases I'm bringing? What are the things that are distracting me from this conversation? Um, how do I make sure I stay focused with Rick right now? Yeah. Um, listening to the content, but then listening for the context. 
listening for the unspoken and, and all of those lead us to listening to the actual meaning that uh, is occurring in the conversation. So transparency, relationship, understanding, shared success. Um, anyone who has worked in the business world or the nonprofit world for very long has been in meetings where there's endless conversation about uh, let's, getting, let's get the words right. Um, and let's get the words right about what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and we find the words that we can all be happy with because we can all give them their, our own meaning to them. That's not shared success. Shared success is having those difficult conversations that um, lead to a shared meaning of what yes. you're looking to accomplish. And then the, the last T is telling the tough truths with caring and candor. That, you know, anybody who's on this call today, just that moment alone when you shared that acronym was just so powerful and insightful, and, and that's wonderful. Um, great insight. Thank you very much. Now, um, earlier on, I, I, I started the call by talking about um, passion and drive and vision. But why do people lose these things along their way, do you think? Life is tough. Yep. yep. Change is tough. <laughs> um, succeeding in business um, that you're leading is tough. Um, we all have role models in our lives, people who um, maybe it's a partner or a golfing buddy or a best friend or um, people whose lives are about getting to the next vacation, getting to retirement so that they can do what they're truly passionate about. Um, I think all of those forces come to play. Um, it becomes sometimes overwhelming to just show up at work and do what needs to be done. And so we get busy with the doing and forget about the being that can lead us into achieving that vision. The being that is at the heart of our passion everything now uh, i know that you have a podcast and we'll touch about that later on because you've mentioned the two words the doing and the being and i'd love for you to share that with us but so what do you mean when you refer to singular change journey so uh, joseph campbell was a psychologist and a mythologist in the mid 20th century mm -hmm. and at some point in his career he began to do research around um, is there a pattern to myth or um, to, to creation myths across cultures and across time? Is there a pattern of in coming of age myths across culture and across time and so forth? And what he discovered was that there's really one pattern that underlies all myth. And he called it the hero's journey. And um, one of the things that he said about the hero's journey is that while we approach each change, as if it's unique and unpredictable, it's not. We take the same journey over and over again. So when I say there's a, a, a singular change journey, that's what I'm talking about. Ah. The catalysts may be different. Yeah. The obstacles may be different. Um, but how we successfully move through that journey has incredible consistency. Yes, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Again, thank you again for sharing. Now, I know that you've also taken that one step further by uh, contributing as an author and you've wrote uh, numerous articles. Tell, tell us a little bit about that experience and how it came about. Well, let me start with how it came about. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> when we started the conversation, we started talking about some of my mentors um, there have been many more, and they have been the ones who've fed my wisdom and growth for decades. When I turned 65, I literally sat and, and reflected and said, I need to be very much more conscious of sharing my wisdom with others 
so that they can learn from my journey and move more quickly and more successfully and further in their own. Yeah. And so that was when, uh, for example, I began to think about doing those 10 lessons videos that I mentioned earlier. Um, I joined the Forbes Coaches Council and wrote 24 articles around change and change leadership um, in, in organizations. Uh, I did about uh, 120-some blog posts around the same topics that became the chapter uh, for uh, Springer International's Handbook of Personal and Organizational Transformation. That's right. called The Hero and the Sherpa. Yep. I did um, about 120 Facebook Lives on the same topic. <laughs> um, I did a TED, TEDx talk yes, just wonderful. over two years ago. How did that feel? How did you feel when you were doing that? Was that exhilarating? Was that nerve-wracking? Yes. Uh, it, all the above. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it was with TEDx Hartford. Yep. And uh signed up. I I think they they went through a selection process and, and signed me up um in the spring or, or very early summer of twenty twenty. So we weren't quite sure how the presentation was going to go. We were talking about possibly um, moving out of an order, possibly in, in an auditorium, possibly moving into a ballroom with, with people more spaced out and so forth. Yep. yep. Um, by the time we got closer to the date, which was in early December of 2020, they had decided to do live streaming from a studio that only had the um, speakers and, and a small studio staff on site. Right. And then Thanksgiving of 2020, my son came down with COVID, was hospitalized. Um, wow. And when we came to the time for the talk, he and I were quarantined at home. <laughs> so I'm actually uh, live streaming from almost exactly where I'm sitting. The background is the same. I had to sit back further and raise my chair up on a couple of boxes <laughs> of uh, printer paper. Um, <laughs> But again, the, the TEDx Hartford team was incredible. They provided me with a coach yep, yep. that worked with me from my first draft of my talk right through to the very end. Um, and it, it was exhilarating. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, importantly, I, as a podcast myself, I'm really interested to learn a little bit about your Doobie podcast and where can people find that? Okay, well... <laughs> I'll answer that question and then talk about the other two. Uh, <laughs> yes, you have others. Yes, yes. Um, we'll go back again to the spring of 2020. Um, March 30th or March 31st of 2020, a, a colleague of, of mine and I uh, were awarded the U.S. trademark on four-day work week. Um, Tony and I had been working together at that point for two or three years, um, as the Doobie Associates, that's D-O hyphen B-E. Uh, Tony identifies as a CPA in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, he really is about good financial reporting, policies, procedures. Um, very structured. Very structured how you do things. Yep. And we all know people who know what they should be doing and they're not doing it. And so that's where I come in as the executive coach on um, who you need to be to succeed in business. So again, we got the, the, the trademark for four day work week right after COVID shut everything down and nobody was interested in a four day work week. They were interested <laughs> in how do they keep their business alive? Oh yeah. And so for the first uh, year or so, that really was the focus of our uh, it's Doobie Time, D-O hyphen B-E Time podcast. <laughs> yep. Um, and then as COVID restrictions began to lift and, and then as the great resignations uh, struck, we really began to focus more and more on um, how do leaders lead through this uncertainty into the future. So the podcast, again, is it's, it's Doobie Time. 
and it's yep. on the Doobie Associates website, do-be Associates website. Um, and and our tagline is because when times are tough in business, it's Doobie time. Love it, absolutely love it. Now, can I, I ask you? Go ahead. I was going to say I also uh, share hosting duties with. Um, the editor of Change Management Review uh, on the Change Management Review podcast. Um, and then I am the host of Conversations Powered by Quantivos, which is a uh, podcast for Quantivos um, that is is addressed on a lot of these topics we're talking about for business leaders at, at all levels of the organization. Um, and all of these podcasts are on their individual websites. So changemanagementreview.com, quantivos.com, which is quantivos is Latin for choose to be your best. Yeah. Um, but they're also available on Apple and Stretcher and Google all the, and yep, many all of the, the other platforms. What a wonderful call. I've really enjoyed this. Now, tell me a little bit about uh, in wrapping up this great call, uh, where people can connect with you if they want to work with you. The The best uh, way to connect with me is to email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at transforminglives.coach. And again, when you do that, we'll set up a complimentary s session where we can certainly talk about working together, but you can really experience also uh, what that work together would be like for you. Thank you again, Brian. Now, if, ever you're, if you're on this call today and you're excited about what you hear, and you should be, there's some nuggets of gold throughout. So if you're not sure, if you've missed something, go back and listen to it again. Uh, no matter where you see this call, you're going to be finding the links back to the emails and uh, transformminglives.coach is the website, if I'm right there, Brian. So uh, if, you, if you're wanting to reach out and con uh, contact and connect with Brian, do so uh, via email or via transformminglives.coach. And with all that being said, Brian, great call. Thank you so very much for joining me on the my future business show today thank you for inviting me rick thanks for joining us today if you enjoyed the call then make sure to subscribe leave a comment share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews and if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop